just charged through. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Ian, you're watching Big Rock Moto, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Now motorcycle manufacturers don't want to talk about this, but motorcycle sales have actually been declining recently. And based on data that I found on Harley Davidson's own investor relations website, Harley sales between 2015 and 2020 dropped a whopping 30%. Now this shouldn't be too surprising because Harley's typical customer base is aging pretty rapidly and younger generations, people even younger than myself, are really not getting into motorcycles all that much. However, with that being said, one segment of motorcycling that is growing despite the overall trend of declining sales is the adventure segment, which has been exploding recently. So it's really not surprising that Harley Davidson would want to capture this new up and coming adventure segment and the lucrative sales that go with that and also try to capture a younger audience based on the obvious fact that their audience is, their typical audience is getting older and older. They also want to appeal to some of their current customers by offering a different and more modern option. Now, before we go any further, I need to ask you one favor as you go through this review. Any preconceptions, any notions or prejudices for or against Harley or the people who ride Harleys or what you think of the people who ride Harleys, you need to put those preconceived notions out the window because this is nothing like other Harley models in the past and it really deserves a fresh look and a blank slate. So that's how we're gonna treat this. So here's how we're gonna break down the review today. We're gonna to do this in typical Big Rock Moto style. Because there's so much interest in this bike and it's a new model, we're gonna go really in depth and really spend our time to figure out this bike. So here's how I'm gonna structure this. First, we're gonna briefly talk about the models and the pricing and the options, how that works. Then I'm gonna show you the riding position of the bike, the seat height. Then I'm gonna drop the bike down, show you how it drops and how it is to lift the bike, which is a real world adventure bike thing that you need to know. Then we're gonna take a tour around the bike, talk about the specs and features, and show you all the equipment and technology that the bike has. Then we're gonna take it off-road, see how it works in the dirt. We're gonna take it on the highway, see how it works on the highway and in the twisties. Then we're gonna come back here, we're gonna talk about the competitors, the pros and cons to the bike, and at the end, we'll have some final thoughts. So with that, let's get riding. So first, let's cover the models, pricing, and equipment for the Pan America. So the Pan America comes in two basic models. It comes in the base model and it comes when the Pan America is special. So for pricing, the base starts at just over $17,000 US and the special starts at, at $20,000 US or more technically, Harley would like me to say 19,999 US. Now both models share the same exact powertrain and chassis but the base model removes the electronic suspension. It removes the tire pressure monitors. It only has one color choice. You have get cast wheels. There's no option for the spoke wheels and you cannot get the adaptive ride height on that base model. Now the Pan America Special, which is this bike you see here, that adds a lot of options uh, available to you. So you can get it in a lot of different color combinations. It also adds the electronic suspension as standard. The adaptive ride height, however, is an option. It's a $1,200 option. Spoke wheels are also an option. That's around $600. So when all is said and done, my test bike without the luggage mounts or without the luggage that you see here, uh, discounting that part, my test bike comes in around $22,700 with freight and destination and all those types of things. And that puts it right in line with something like an R1250 GS, something at that level. All right, let's take a look at the riding position and the seat height of the bike. So uh, the seat height is a little confusing because if you get the adaptive ride height, what that does is when the motorcycle, when you're riding a motorcycle, when you come to a stop, it drops the bike uh, almost an inch. I think it's about three quarters of an inch. So if you don't have the adaptive ride height option, you're looking at 33.5 inches in the low position, 34 and a half inches in the high position. I believe there is an accessory lower seat available as well. When you turn on the adaptive ride height, or if you have that feature on your bike and you're gonna have it turned on, it drops it almost an inch. So you're looking at about 32 and a half uh, or 33 and a half in the high setting. So let me show you what this looks like. So here's the interesting thing about the adaptive ride height. Once the bike sits for a while, it actually pumps the suspension back up to full height. So in order for that system to be active right now, I've got to turn the ignition on you can't really see it in the video, but it just dropped about that one inch height that I'm talking about. So now you can see I'm five foot 11 
I'll put the centimeters here, I think it's 180 centimeters, and I can flat foot the bike on both sides with both feet. So that's good. Now the position of riding, let me kind of show you that here. So the riding position is extremely upright and extremely neutral. Very comfortable, have no complaints about that. The bars come back to meet you nicely, and it's a great position to ride in all day. And then for standing, the standing position is also very good. All right, I'm probably gonna regret this, but let's do the drop and lift test. So I am on concrete, but I put down a blanket so Harley Davidson doesn't get mad at me so I don't scratch up their bike. So let's go ahead and carefully put this bike on the ground and see how it is to lift a nearly 600 pound adventure bike. This can only go well. All right, so as you can see, the motorcycle definitely falls pretty much all the way down because it's not like a GS with the cylinder sticking out the side. It doesn't have crash bars to stick too far out. Now let me grab the camera and show you where the bike is contacting the ground. All right, so let's come around and take a look at where she's contacting the ground. So you can see here how flat uh, the bike definitely does fall. You can see it's resting on the uh, front engine guard here. Get my camera to focus, there we go. Coming on to this side. We can see that it's resting, kind of what you would expect on the different foot pegs and the foot peg brackets. And you can see again where it's contacting that front engine bar there. Uh, it doesn't look like the luggage rack is touching. So now let's get the bike back on, or let's get the camera back on the tripod and see how it is to lift this beast. Here's one more view of the bike laying down. So you can see what you're dealing with if you drop your adventure bike, which you will if you use it as an adventure bike. Okay, let's attempt to lift the Pan America. It's not like I have anybody to help me here, so we can try this here. So I can kind of pivot it, and I think it's contacting the uh, rear uh, uh, foot peg and also the engine bar there. So I can kind of pivot it like this and feel how it's gonna be. So I'm gonna to need to lift with my legs here. So I'm gonna to have to turn my back to the camera. Okay, that's not very much fun, no matter how you do it, no matter how strong you are. It's still almost 600 pounds. The handguard did pop off, but the handguard didn't break, so that's good. Uh, let me get the camera and we can expect, inspect where the bike was hitting. So because I had a blanket down, the bike didn't really get too much scratches, but you can see there is kind of a scratch on the crash bar uh, right there a little bit. So we won't tell Harley about that now, will we? And then uh, nothing else got damaged because again, I had put that blanket down to be nice to the bike. All right, let's check out the specs and take a quick tour of the Pan America. Let's start with what everybody cares about, and that's the engine. So this is Harley's new 1250 Revolution Max engine. It's a V-twin configuration, and it uses hydraulic valves. You never have to do a valve adjustment. In terms of horsepower, she's putting out 150 horsepower, or about 112 kilowatts, and that comes in way up at 9,000 RPM. In terms of torque, it's putting out 94 foot-pounds or 127 newton meters, and that's coming in at just around 6,700 RPM. The actual displacement on this engine is 1,252 cc, and it's a relatively high compression ratio of 13 to 1, so it does need premium fuel to run most effectively. Let's talk about the suspension. So you have an inverted front fork with seven and a half inches of travel and it's electronically controlled on the Pan America Special. So it's an active suspension. It detects what's going on and it adjusts the damping as you go. And you can configure the damping and the preload also using the bike's computer. Going to the back, you've got a monoshock in here and it's the same amount of travel at seven and a half inches. Let's look at the tires, wheels, and brakes. So the Pan America uses a 19 inch front wheel common uh, with these big adventure bikes, and it's a 120 width front tire. This bike's wearing the Anarchy Wilds, which are the optional knobby tires. Uh, otherwise, the bike would come with Michelin uh, Scorcher, which is also known as the Anarchy Adventure, same tread pattern. 
In terms of brakes, in the front you have dual 320 millimeter disc, excuse me, and dual four piston Brembo calipers. So really nice braking equipment on this Harley. And then in the back you have a single 280 millimeter disc, also with a Brembo caliper there. And the rear tire is a 170 width tire. So very similar to the big GS with that big fat 170 rear tire. Let's talk about maintenance for a second. So this bike holds uh, 4.75 quarts of oil, so pretty big oil capacity. You're supposed to do an oil change at 1,000 miles or about 1,500 kilometers, and then every, I think every 5,000 miles thereafter. You never have to adjust the valves because they're hydraulically adjusted valves. In terms of the oil change, it's easy to do, just a drain plug, easy filter to get to there. Other maintenance you're going to have to do, well, it's a chain drive, so you are going to have to tension the chain, clean the chain, and lube the chain if you're so inclined to keep that chain running nice and smooth. Another maintenance item that you care about is the air filter if you're going to be riding in off-road conditions. And unfortunately, you do have to remove the gas tank to get to the air filter on the Pan America. That is one downside that I do want to note. Um, you know, some Harleys have an air filter out here to the side. A lot of the modern adventure bikes have an air filter under the seat. Some are easy to get to and some don't. I know the Africa Twins are famous for having to remove a bunch of stuff to get to the air filter. So I would have liked to have seen that different, but that's just something I want you to keep in mind. You do have to pull this fuel tank off to get to your air filter. Let's talk about the fuel tank capacity. It's 5.6 gallons or about 21 liters. And that's good for around 200 miles of riding, depending on how fast you're going. I tend to get between 40 to 45 miles per gallon riding this bike. The other thing you want to know is the weight. So it is 569 pounds or 258 kilograms, fully fueled up and ready to ride. Now that is slightly heavier than something like a Arto Hefty GS, which comes in right around 550 pounds. But do keep in mind that you are getting engine bars here, these kind of crash bars as standard, which don't come on the GS models. So that accounts for a little bit of the weight difference. In the real world, it's very similar to something like a GS or Multistrada in terms of weight in this 1200cc class. All right, quick tour of the Pan America starting at the front. So this upper light here, this is your cornering light, which I've tested. It works very, very well. The lower light here, the controversial design of it, this is your low and high beam LED light. You've got kind of a, a metal bar underneath the headlight here. You've got the lower front fender. This bike doesn't have one of those beaks like some adventure bikes do. So that's kind of a nice thing, depending on your perspective. Uh, we've already talked about the tires and brakes. You can see the radiator here behind the front wheel. You'd probably want to get a radiator guard if you're do doing a lot of off-road. This is one thing I don't like, how the rectifier sticks out here outside of the skid plate, and the battery is behind here too. So it seems like a lot of electrical components, very low on the bike, susceptible to rocks, mud, sand, you know, water, things like that. The F Harley accessory skid plate covers that if you want to get the accessory skid plate, and I would highly, highly recommend doing that. Moving around, uh, you can see the front turn signals, which to me, they look kind of cheap, but they do have the Harley logo in them. Um, they are uh, LED, which is a nice thing. You can see the engine bar here that we talked about. Engine, the side of the gas tank, you can see the large exhaust pipes coming out here. You do get a lot of heat coming off this exhaust. I've noticed on your leg, you've got your brake lever, foot peg with a removable rubber here. Oversized foot pegs would be a good idea for off-roading. You can see a detachable subframe. You can see the passenger pegs here. This rear luggage, these pannier uh, carriers are not standard. That's an additional extra, so disregard that. Catalytic converter down here. This is the factory exhaust, not an aftermarket or upgraded exhaust. You can see the rider and passenger seat here, which uh, is adjustable for height on the rider seat. Grab handles, you can see coming around the back, license plate holder, LED rear taillight, and LED turn signals, which again, I just feel like some of those finishing touches just don't feel very premium, if I'm being honest. Coming around here, you've got the chain, chain guard. Uh, this bike has a SAE outlet. I don't think that's standard. That's probably something that uh, the dealership or they put on for the demo bike. Center stand, nice thing to have. No quick shifter, and that's one thing I'm gonna talk about later. I do wish it came with a quick shifter at this price. The left side of the engine, you ha have quite a bit of mechanical stuff going on here. You can see kind of the spark plug wires here going into this junction box, and then you can actually see the spark plug. So that's one good thing. If you need to change spark plugs, <laughs> they're right there. You don't have to take anything off to get to them. You can see this large fan sucking air through the radiator there when it gets hot. And this bike does tend to run pretty warm. Anyway, so 
um, handguards, let's continue our tour of this area. So the handguards, I don't know why they kind of design like this where they always are popping out of the end, but that's just another little refinement issue. If you're going to off-road the bike and plan on dropping it, these are not going to be adequate, so you're going to want to replace those. Uh, the levers, you have adjustable brake and clutch levers here, which I like to see. Uh, it is a uh, cable clutch, not a hydraulic clutch. So that's kind of an interesting choice there on a premium bike. The switch gear here, you can see you've got the high-low beam switch, the cruise control buttons here, heated grips. This is a, a menu button to cycle through different settings. You've got a four-way controller with a button in the middle. And then you've got another menu button, a home button, turn signals, and horn. The thing with these buttons is they're, they don't have any tactile feedback. They're very mushy, and sometimes the button press registers, and sometimes it doesn't. You have to press it really hard for it to work, and there's really no way without looking at the screen to see if your button is actually being pressed. So I don't love the way the switch gear feels, although the controls are fairly logically laid out. Over here, you've got a riding mode button, which is uh, great to have that. And you've got different riding modes, which we'll talk about in a second. And you've got a hazard light. You've got the, uh, you know, stop start switch and the st uh, start button in the middle. Then you've got controls here for your media, you know, back and forth, play, volume up and down. You can see the mirrors. I feel like the mirrors look like something from a discount auto parts store. Not trying to be rude, but they just do something like you get at Pep Boys or AutoZone. Just don't like the way they look, but they work fine. Uh, coming up here to the windshield adjustment. So to adjust the windshield, it is a one-handed affair, but you have to grasp this little latch here, you see, and then you can move it up and down. Now, I find this to be very flimsy, and it feels cheap, and when you're riding, it's wobbling around, but it hasn't broken on me, so I guess it does a job. Also, I've, I have noticed that when it gets dusty, this kind of gets stiff. So not a huge fan of that mechanism. I feel that could be done a little bit better. Although, to their credit, the GS is also a little bit wobbly, too. Now let's jump on board here and talk about the TFT. But before I get to that, the handlebar. So one thing that I've noticed about this bike is the top of the forks and the triple clamp is very far away and very far down, which means they use a huge riser and they use a very... Uh, a, a handlebar with a lot of rise and a lot of sweep. I don't find that that has any effect on handling or anything, but it's just something to note that I thought was very different about this bike than bikes I'm used to. You also have a steering damper here, which is a nice touch. Let's talk about this TFT and the electronics on the bike. So, uh, this is the way the dashboard looks. So, on flanking on the sides, you've got different readouts here, which I believe you can customize. Uh, but I've got it showing my fuel range, trip A, trip B, tire pressures, uh, phone information here, fuel gauge, and then I've got uh, engine temperature, or outside temperature, and uh, battery voltage, and you've got all these lights. Everything is on the TFT. A lot of different lights that light up here, a clock, of course a Harley logo at the bottom. You've got a tachometer, the riding mode indicator here, and if I press the mode button, you'll see uh, off-road mode, A, uh, rain mode, highway mode, sport mode. So you can we can customize that, I'll show you that in a second. And you've also got a gear indicator and a suspension indicator light here, which is flashing. So overall, the TFT is very bright, contrasty. It's big enough. The text on the sides and the overall text of the whole screen, because you sit back here, it's a little bit small and I kind of have to squint to read some of it. Although the important stuff you can see, like your speed and your RPM. So let's talk about how this all works. So over here in the left switch gear, if you, if you uh, have this press this button here it toggles through the information in the middle so you can have odometer temperature range so this is bigger text than the ones on the side so you have that option to display different things here uh, let's set it up to have fuel range i guess i like that now uh, let's let's cover uh well let's go into the menus here so to go oops almost dropped the bike uh, to go into the menus so if you hit this button here which shows like these different screens uh, what you get is you'll cycle through um, different uh, options here. So that's motorcycle, that's settings, that's home, that's navigation. So for this portion, let's go into the motorcycle here, and this is your diagnostics. So you can see uh, it's going to give you tire pressures, temperatures, voltage, but we have all that stuff on the main screen, so we don't really need to to see that. So let's let's go back, go back into menu. Let's go to uh, settings. So in here, we can go in and uh, adjust different settings here, adjust the date, we can adjust the clock. Um, using this menu system and this, this computer is actually pretty easy. Let's go into ride customization. I've got hill hold control on. 
uh, you can change the angle of the uh, of the uh, corning lights, which is cool. Ride mode. So. Let's cover the riding modes on the Panamerica. So you've got a mode switch over here on the right uh, switch cluster, which you can sort through your pre-selected modes. Now, let's go into the menu and sort out how this works and how to set these up. So if you hit the menu button and you go into settings and you go into ride customization and you go into ride modes, now you can select your ride mode. So road is always on. Sport, now it lets you turn these modes off and on. And if you turn it off, it's not gonna come up when you cycle through your ride modes. So we'll leave sport on. And you can't customize these first three. These are set up with factory defaults, okay? But you can turn off sport and off-road plus if you don't want them. Now you've got two custom modes. So custom mode A, I'm gonna set up for my off-road mode, okay? So if I go in here, I don't wanna copy from another mode, so I go down. Now I can set up um, how I want this to work. So I'm gonna have engine braking here more. I selected the engine map to be off-road, okay? Throttle response, I'm going to have as a little bit less because I want it to be a little bit softer. Doesn't change the power, just gives me more progressive throttle. Traction control, I'm going to go to sport, which is less intrusive. I wish there was more customization on the traction control, to be honest. ABS, we're going to go into off-road. Suspension damping, we're going to have as off-road uh, here. And adaptive ride height, we're going to have as automatic, okay? So, now I've set up that A mode to be my off-road mode. Or if I want, of course, I can use the standard off-road mode. Custom B, I'm going to leave that turned off, but if it was my bike, I would set up that up for my highway kind of sport mode for my own custom settings. So now when I go back home, if I cycle through these modes, uh, I have the highway mode, I've got sport mode, this is the off-road mode, the built-in off-road mode. A mode is my custom A mode, which I set up for off-road, and then it takes me back to highway. So that's the riding modes on the Pan Am. All right, I want to quickly show you the uh, the interface with your phone, so navigation media control on the Pan America. So I've got my headset, my center headset connected to the bike, and I've got my phone paired to the bike, which takes just a couple minutes. And I use an Android phone just for what it's worth. There's also a USB-C port right up here, just in case you need to power your phone. Now, uh, to scroll through the different functions here, I hit this, this scroll button here. Now, this is navigation, so on navigation you can see here the map, and I can scroll in and out. The resolution is not great, and it's not the most functional thing I've ever seen. Um, I also forgot to mention that this TFT, if I didn't mention it before, is a touch screen, so you can do things here uh, with your hand, which is really, really nice to have. The only other adventure bike with a touch screen, I think, is the Africa Twin. So navigation, you can enter a destination via the Harley-Davidson app on your phone and then navigate here on your screen. Now if you want to scroll to music, you scroll over here to music, and now I can control the music through my headset with the handlebar controls. So I can play music here, I can go back and forth, and I can adjust the volume, and all that works very, very well. And then of course, to get back home, I just hit back to the home button. So I'm pretty happy with how it integrates to the bike. It's not as good at Apple CarPlay or Android Auto on the Africa Twin that I have, but it's a pretty good system. And I would say this is a little bit better and less clunky maybe than the BMW system and some of the others that I've used. All right, you guys ready to ride some dirt on the Harley Pan America? Let's get to it, shall we? So here's what we're gonna do. We're going to turn the ignition on. We're going to get the bike set into the mode that I set up for off-roading. So that is going to be custom mode A. So one thing I found out I was wrong about earlier. Shut off. Shut off my music there. Sorry about that. One thing I was wrong about earlier is that the off-road ABS does not turn the ABS off. It simply makes it less intrusive. And for the life of me, I should have read the, the book, but I can't find the button to turn off the ABS entirely, but that's okay. It's not going to affect the test. And I'll put that information uh, below here in the text so I can make sure this video is complete. So let's, uh, let's get going. Yeah. Oh, very. 
very rocky very rocky through here whoa okay big rocks big rocks let's just charge through with reckless abandon try not to break the bike <laughs> it shouldn't work like this it shouldn't be this good so once I get through these rocks I'll talk about what I'm feeling here camera's going crazy oh. oh big rock big rock maybe that's where I got my channel name all right Whew. all right let me slow down a little bit so I can talk about this thing off-road so I think one of the most surprising things to me about the Pan America in the past three weeks that I've been testing it is how proficient it is as an off-road adventure bike. I didn't really expect it because, you know, I've ridden all the big adventure bikes more or less and I've talked about this before, but the big 1200cc adventure bikes do not make the best off-road bikes. They're more of a street bike that can go on dirt roads. And I'm not going to go into whole, that whole soapbox right now. But what I will say in the Harley's defense here is that the suspension is great. This um, Showa electronic suspension, um, it makes very good use of its seven and a half inches of travel. The, the, the damping is very well controlled and I can ride this bike. I feel that I can ride this bike faster than I can ride a 1250GS on roads like this. I mean, I'm really moving along here. The video probably doesn't show it but I can ride this bike pretty much at its limits um, of the suspension and tires. It inspires a lot of confidence. The suspension works great, soaking up all these rocks and all these bumps. And uh, yeah, you can really get a move on. The bike doesn't feel heavy when you're doing this either. It feels heavy kind of at a standstill or pushing it around. But man, once you start moving, the bike really sheds its weight off-road. The chassis, the overall chassis is just very good at this and I can even you know hit stuff wrong I can sit down instead of standing up I can make all the mistakes and the bike still gets me through it the electronics work well uh, the different all the different settings how you can customize uh, the ergonomics are good for off-roading the standing position is pretty good I'm extremely impressed for a 570 pound 150 horsepower adventure bike how this thing gets along off-road it's not a ktm 1290 you know super adventure r it's not a ktm 890r like i have but for a big bike it's damn good damn good the traction control is very nice it's not too intrusive it doesn't um, feel stuttery you know like some bikes do uh, the off-road ABS setting allows you to slip the rear wheel a little bit, but not too much. And of course you can turn all that stuff off. So if I hold down the TC button, that'll turn off. I got to come to a stop. Hold down the TC button. It'll turn off my traction control. Oh yeah, now I can feel... Now traction control is totally off, so I gotta be super careful. Whoa! Yeah, boy. <laughs> now I can really kick out that rear end. So you still feel the weight of it. I mean, it's it can't defy physics. Uh, you know, going around sharper corners, going through these bigger ruts. You still definitely feel um, the weight of the bike but it's, it's really well controlled and I have to work pretty hard to get the suspension to bottom out. Oh, I like this traction control off. With these Anarchy Wild tires, that works really well. I'm having fun, dude. Yeah. Ooh. Okay, probably a good time to turn around.
Oh man, this is way too much fun. So the Pan America is legit off-road. You could do the BDRs on this. You could really uh, push this thing hard. It's not magically going to be a dirt bike, but compared to a Multistrada, compared to a GS, compared to an Africa Twin, compared to all the big adventure bikes, uh, this thing is very, very good. It's up at the very top of those. And you guys might not believe me, but if you ride one and really experience it, I mean, you're just going to have to take my word for it. This thing is very capable, and I can tell they put a lot of thought and engineering into making this bike work well off-road. I like the suspension uh, damping and the setup better than a GS. It's not quite as good maybe as my Africa Twin, but it doesn't have as much travel as that either. Uh, so with that, let's move on to the next part of the test. Oh, don't hit that. Don't hit that. Break, 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 break. Okay, I wanted to go up here and talk about the, the steering lock and the slow speed throttle control. So, if you let out the clutch, the bike does a pretty good job of idling along about eight miles an hour, and it doesn't want to stall too badly. Now, the steering lock steering lock is pretty pretty generous on this bike it's not as good as the Africa twin but it is it's good you can do tight turns the clutch control is pretty good so I feel like I could when I need to you know crawl through more technical terrain at low speeds I would I would give this the edge on the Tiger 1200 that I just tested I had some low speed issues with that bike but this Harley is is pretty decent. All right, let's get this Pan America on the highway and see how she goes. Okay, let's go into sport mode and give this thing the beans a little bit here. <laughs> oh yes. This is not your grandfather's Harley Davidson. Whew. Okay, let's do some roll on throttle here. <laughs> oh God, this is good. So cruising on the highway, what do we notice? Well, the bike is extraordinarily comfortable. You've got a comfortable seat. The riding position is very comfortable. The wind protection is pretty darn good. And I find the windshield in one click below the highest position provides very good protection with not much buffeting. If I lower the windshield down, I get nice airflow onto my helmet. Uh, vibration from the engine, there's really not much vibration to speak of. The engine is very smooth. You don't feel any buzz coming through the handlebars, so I can really appreciate that. Cruise control works great. I'll demonstrate that now. So I set the cruise, there we go, 60 miles an hour, hands off the bars, very stable, very comfortable. There's no indication of what speed you have the cruise control set, it's just an indication that the cruise control is on. And you have a plus or minus button there. So that works well. Uh, let's talk about the brakes for a second. Brakes are very good. You've got dual Brembo's in the front, those big rotors, this thing hauls down really well and keep in mind I have knobby tires on so I uh, don't have the greatest traction with these knobbies so what else can we talk about uh, riding here on the highway uh, in sixth gear at 65 miles an hour you're under 4,000 rpm so it's a very relaxed engine it's not high revving at all so that's something I really appreciate a roll on power the mid-range and top end of this engine is really phenomenal so in sixth gear at 60 miles an hour if I roll on it accelerates rapidly very very good and of course if I drop a couple gears that's gonna be even a lot better Right. How does the Pan America do on twisty roads, sport riding situations? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's find out.
So let's go into sport mode here to make everything more aggressive, firm up the suspension, sharpen up the throttle response, check for traffic. Let's punch it. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm on knobby tires, so I have to hold back a little bit. And I'm on a public road, of course. Now I have ridden this bike with street tires, and boy is it good. It's still good with the knobbies, but I just have to hold back a little bit. <laughs> oh this thing is so fun so engaging to ride you know the motor has so much pull and so much character it's not the best sounding engine i've ever heard um but it's not bad to let that truck get ahead a little bit here. So this thing, basically, it's a blast to ride on twisty roads like this. You could sport tour this bike all day and it'd be an incredible comfort. It's not too heavy. It's got a ton of power. The brakes are great. The suspension is great. You can adjust everything electronically. Um, man, I don't have much to complain about here as kind of like a sport touring bike so even if you never want to go off-road which i suspect is the case for a lot of pan america owners <laughs> this thing can tear it up on the street man this is not the harley davidson that you're familiar with oh yeah So yeah, if you're thinking of getting one of these and using it mostly on, you know, for sport type riding, I don't think you're going to be too disappointed. I mean, it is an adventure bike. You have to realize it's not, you know, a sport bike. It has a 19 inch front wheel. It's got more suspension travel. But with all that being said, damn, is it pretty good. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that ride as much as, as I did. This bike is an absolute blast to ride. I'm really not exaggerating about that. It truly is fun to ride. So what are the pros and cons as I see it to the Pan America? So let's start with the pros. We've covered a lot of this already, so I'm going to go through these quickly. The engine, ton of power, ton of torque, super fun. It revs quickly, has character. I don't love the way it sounds, but it sounds okay. But it gives the bike personality and it makes it fun to ride. The second thing I really like is the suspension. The suspension with the electronic suspension, uh, all the settings that you have, but mostly off-road is where I was really impressed with the suspension. The, the suspension deals with off-road terrain exceptionally well for a big full-size adventure bike. And you have the electronic control, so on the highway you can stiffen it up. Works very, very well. The next thing I really like is I was impressed overall with its off-road ability. For a big, heavy adventure bike in this class, I think this is one of the best that I've ridden, and I really do mean that. It's very, very good. The overall chassis and suspension, it's a great performing off-road adventure bike, and you can really carry a surprising amount of speed through rough terrain. The next thing I like are the electronics overall are very easy to use. I like the TFT screen. Some of the text is a little bit small, but overall how you interact with it, uh, the way the menus are set up is pretty easy to use, and I appreciate that. I also think that the, the music interface and the navigation interface is pretty decent. There's two killer features that this bike has that I really appreciate and I think matter a lot to people in the real world. One is the adaptive ride height, which we've talked about. The second is the hydraulic valve, so you never have to adjust the valves, which saves you a lot of maintenance cost over the long run. And finally, the last thing I really want to mention, there's a lot of good things about this bike, obviously, and I'm just touching on a few of them. The styling. When I first saw this bike teased years ago, before it was actually for sale, I, I kind of laughed, and honestly, I shouldn't be saying this, but I thought it was almost a joke. Like, the styling didn't look right to me, especially from the front. But the more I've spent time with it, the more I look at it, the more I see others on the road, the styling has really grown on me, and I think, how new things work is that when something is brand new, you tend to not like it. When it has more time to sink in, you tend to be more okay with it. And I actually like the styling. I think it's unique and different, and I think they were daring with the styling. 
All right, so let's talk about what I didn't love about the Pan America. Again, we've touched on a lot of this through the video, so I'm gonna kind of gloss through these. Switch gear, I don't like the way the switch gear feels, and the placement of some of the buttons is a little bit odd. I just don't love the way that the switch gear is. Second thing I don't like, the kickstand is awkward. It's about six inches, six inches in front of your foot, and it's kind of awkward to get that kickstand up and down, although you do get used to it. Third thing is I don't like where they put the regulator rectifier and the battery down low there sticking out of the skid plate. You do have the accessory skid plate which can cover that or aftermarket solutions, but it seems like an odd place to put it in terms of water getting in there and, and mud and, and sand. I just don't understand why they did that. The fourth thing that I kind of can nitpick is that I feel like for this price, it should come with quick shifter as standard. I think all of its competitors at this price point come with quick shifter. If you look at, if you look at the price level of this and how almost all those other bikes come off the showroom floor, they're gonna have a quick shifter. I think this should have it. Now I know some people don't like it or don't want it. And in that case, you should be able to turn it off in the menu system of the bike in a computer, which is how most bikes are set up. So just something that I think that Harley could keep in mind, adding a standard quick shifter in the future. The next thing is, I wish the traction control had more levels. Having like rain, road, sport, uh, it's not really enough levels to customize the traction control. It's a, traction control is an amazing riding aid on these big powerful adventure bikes and I'd like to have more ability to fine tune the system. So three levels is just not enough. The next thing that I really noticed, especially riding in the warmer weather, the bike puts off a lot of engine heat. I don't know if it's the V-twin design or the way the exhaust is. Now all modern bikes have some level of engine heat. The Euro 5 requirements have have made the engines a bit hotter, made the exhaust hotter because you've got less gas coming out the tailpipe. It makes more heat. Anyway, that's another story. But yeah, the, the engine heat was pretty intrusive and it definitely heated up my legs more so than most other bikes. The last thing, and I've touched on this through the review, is the overall details and refinement are a little bit lacking from the switch gear to the wobbly windshield adjuster, to the turn signals and the mirrors that look like they came from kind of a discount, discount auto parts store, to the way they did the kickstand. A lot of the little finer touches are not that refined and not that finished. And I feel like you're, you're sacrificing that when you buy this over some of those other higher end European bikes or even the Honda Africa Twin. But you're gaining a lot and we've talked about the things you're gaining as well. All right, so how does the Harley stack up against the competition? So I can't go into great detail here because it would take all day and this video is already getting really long. Uh, but here's what I'll say about this versus the competition. This bike really doesn't give up in any major area to the premium competitors out there, whether it's a GS, a Multistrada, an Africa Twin, uh, a Super Tenere, any, any of the big premium adventure bikes, the KTMs, it really can hold its own in almost every single area. And I think that's a great achievement for Harley's first adventure bike. There's some standout pros to maybe getting the Harley over some of those other bikes. So what makes it unique? Harley Davidson has a great dealer network, at least here in the United States where I live. I see Harley dealers everywhere when I'm traveling and I don't see that with some of the other European brands. So that's a big pro. The other standout features we've talked about, the adaptive ride height, innovative, smart, useful in a real world. The hydraulic valves, again, innovative, smart, useful because you're reducing your maintenance cost and time at the dealer with never having to do valve adjustments. One thing I want to mention in terms of the competition is some of its competitors use a shaft drive. So the Tiger 1200s, the new ones use shaft drive. The R1250 GS uses shaft. The Super Tenere uses shaft. Shaft drive is less maintenance, but it adds some weight and it reduces your power transfer. Chain drive is lighter, has better power transfer, but there's a lot more maintenance associated with the chain drive. So that's going to be plus or minus depending on your perspective. Overall, is the Pan America quite as refined or premium feeling as some of its competitors? No, honestly, it isn't. But it more than makes up for that, in my opinion, in terms of its overall character, its uniqueness, some of the standout features, and how much fun it is to ride in all different conditions. So I would say very seriously, don't buy any of the competitive bikes without doing a demo ride on the Pan America. It's absolutely good enough to stand up to those other bikes and I think you need to give it a shot uh, before going with any of the main competition. Final thoughts on the Harley Davidson Pan America. This is one of the most challenging motorcycle reviews that I've done in the past several years of doing this. And the reason is that it really challenged my preconceived notions about Harley Davidson. When I put on my journalist hat and try to be objective, I need to throw out what I've thought of the brand over the years. And to show my underbelly here and be a little bit vulnerable, I've never been a fan of American cruiser bike culture. Loud pipes, tattoos, hanging around bars, riding in big groups. These things have absolutely zero appeal to me. 
But you have to put that aside, and I've had to put that aside because the Pan America has nothing to do with any of that. So if you're somebody like me out there considering the Pan America versus its long-standing competitors, you really have to force yourself to put aside any notions you have about the brand, whether they're good or bad, because I know a lot of people love Harley Davidson and love that American cruiser culture, and I think that's amazing. I think that's great. I have nothing, absolutely nothing against that. So once you put aside any feelings you might have, the Pan America reveals itself as an amazingly capable and amazingly competitive full-size adventure bike. I've covered pretty much everything in the review already, but I really can't say enough good things about its overall performance. Now reliability, it's a new model, so that's a question mark. There's no way I can answer that. Ownership experience, that's where you come in. I can't answer that because I don't own this bike, but hopefully owners, you can chime in below and we can have a discussion in this community about that. So I sincerely hope I've told you everything that you've been wondering, everything you wanted to know about the Pan America. If I haven't, please put comments and questions below in the uh, video description, I mean, sorry, in the video comments and I'll be sure to get to that. Please support content creation like this on my channel. Uh, there's ways to do that in the video description below and I really appreciate it. Other than that, please ride safe and I'll see you out there.